Caution! Friend fight today! We're gonna be reacting to Dave Ramsey's most controversial advice. Brent, I am so excited about this because we love a lot of the stuff that the Ramsey organization puts out. They've done amazing things out there, but every now and then something will be said and we're just like, ah, not quite. No, that's just not exactly the way that we would have said it. That's not the way that we would have communicated that. We thought it might be valuable for us to walk through some of those things today. Yeah, and by the way, if you're if you're looking for some Dave Ramsey hate or Ramsey solutions hate, that's not the right place. But I do think it is very beneficial for all my financial mutants to see compare and contrast on some of the controversial takes that Dave has. And I'll go ahead and tell you, I can't wait. So you guys get to find out that if we're Pharisees or not. Oh, look at that lady. All right, let's check out this first video. Here we go. Hey, Dave, thanks for taking the call. I have another should we pay off the house early out of our retirement question for you. Okay. Why is this one different? Um, <laughs> Dave thought that was funny. He tickled himself. Well, we're, my wife and I are both retired. Uh-huh. I'm, 50, I'm 61. She's 58. We retired with the mortgage. Mm-hmm. I've got a number of differing opinions from our financial guy. I've got mm-hmm. friends that work in the finance industry. I, I guess just looking for another opinion, maybe one with a little bit more credence than some of the others, I guess. <laughs> okay. But, so how much do you own your home? Uh, so it's a $450,000 house. We owe one hundred and seventy. How much? What's your net worth? What do you have in your nest egg? Um, net worth is about a million and a quarter. We've got uh, just over a million of that is... Uh, investment and retirement. If your house was paid um, off, why, if, house. if your house was paid off, why would you go borrow on it? Uh, we would not. Then what's the difference? Okay, let me rephrase the question. Maybe a, a, a better question is: if we decide to do this, is it a process over multiple years to ease a tax burden? Do we just bite the bullet and that's a good question? Take the hit and do it once, or? How, how would I do it? Maybe I've been doing this 30 work. years. I've never had anybody call me back and say they were pissed off because they paid off their house. Oh, Dave. I mean, there's just no there's just no downside to this. So no. one shot, or would you... Uh, I'd write a check today. I'd be debt-free. I'd have been debt-free yesterday. If I remember. Can you write a check on a retirement account? Listen to all these idiots. There's a lot of idiots out there running around with an opinion about your money, and you're a millionaire. Well, okay. Uh, so, yeah, so right there, for those of you who, may, who maybe missed it, this is a retired couple, 61 and 58. They are retired. They have a little over a million-dollar portfolio, and they owe $170,000 on their mortgage. And they're asked the question, hey, should I just pay off the mortgage, pull it out of our retirement account, pay it off, or should I do some other strategy? And Dave says, unequivocally, does it matter No, pay it off right now today. Pay it off yesterday. Look, two wrongs do not make a right. I want to give respect to Dave and the fact that he is, is, uh, me and him agree on the fact that I think when you go into retirement, I want you to be completely debt free. Mm -hmm. This person crossed into retirement still carrying a, a mortgage. So that's less than ideal. I completely agree with Dave on that. However, now if this person came to me, and says, hey, I'm in retirement, I have seven-figure investment portfolio, but I also still have this $170,000 mortgage, I have to triage them as they are, Mm -hmm. not as how they should have been. Mm -hmm. Because I would have told them, if they'd come to me pre-retirement, I would have said, hey, maybe you need to work an extra year. Maybe Mm -hmm. you need to work an extra two years to get that mortgage completely paid off. But coming to me now, I have to kind of give them the best answer for all the variables and I'll be honest with you, Bill, I don't know that we have all the information, but I can definitely tell you I don't agree with everything Dave said there. Well, I think what I, what I really struggle with is Dave immediately jumped to an answer, and I feel like there's a ton of information that he did not have. There's a ton of questions that were not answered. Like, here's a real easy one. Okay, he says he got over a million bucks in an investment portfolio, what types of accounts are those yeah. in? Is that a million dollars in a 401k or is it a million dollars in a taxable account? Because that matters. 
Uh, how about this? What are their living expenses? How much do they need to live the life that they want to need? And what are their income sources that are paying for that? Is it their portfolio that's providing for their living expenses or do they have other stuff coming in? And then what about this one? And I think this one, Dave, he'd want to fight me if he were here. But what's the interest rate on that mortgage? Yeah. Maybe this mortgage is at a super low interest rate. And so does it make sense to take that $170,000 potentially out of a tax favored account and satisfy a super low interest mortgage at this stage? I just feel like he jumped to a conclusion without really diving into the details to know what the best answer would yeah, have been. And definitely in this moment in time where interest rates are super high, mortgage rates are around 8%. Mm -hmm. If this person comes to you and they have a mortgage sub 4%, sub 3%, because check out this data, 62% of homeowners have mortgages that are rates below 4%. Mm -hmm. 24% have rates below 3%. If this if you think about the fact that he's got a million dollars working for him and we're thinking about how to give him his best retirement, I don't know if he's got a 2.5% mortgage if I'm loving him yanking that out, especially if it's in retirement accounts because there's going to be income taxes, there's going to be all other, th other things that create friction and other costs with getting access to that money. And what we think is awesome is we love having the goal of being debt-free, but most folks have the goal of making it through retirement, making it through financial independence without running out of money. And I don't feel like Dave dove deep enough into that to make sure that that was sound advice. Because draining your retirement accounts to pay off your mortgage might not be smart because the mathematics might not substantiate it. If you have a million dollar portfolio and you are pulling off of that at a sustainable withdrawal rate to pay for your living expenses, and then you take 20% of that amount and go pay off the mortgage, well now the amount that you pull off your portfolio either needs to decrease or you have a super high withdrawal rate, which could be detrimental over the long term. I feel like we're sacrificing a future goal potentially to satisfy a very short-term goal today. That is a great way of putting it, because here's where I, I think things are, is Dave gave them a permanent solution to something that has, I think, a temporary problem. Mm -hmm. And and that is something that, that gives me a lot of pause, because I think that if I was in Dave's shoes and sitting at that desk, I would have said, "This is you've got a mistake. You went into retirement with debt. Mm -hmm. What sacrifice are you going to make? And we have to figure out, is this a two-year problem? Is this a three-year problem? Is this a five-year problem mm -hmm. that you're going to be on your P's and Q's with your living expenses, and you're going to extinguish this debt as fast as mm -hmm. possible? That is the way I would have worked through it after getting additional variables, because we need to know account structure. We need to know interest rate. We just don't have enough, but I definitely wouldn't have said, hey, just knee-jerk, pay this off, potentially jeopardizing the health and wealth of his retirement plan. You're saying there's a difference in the get wealthy behaviors, right? Like getting debt free and paying off debt would be like a getting wealthy behavior, but understanding your current financial circumstance and where you're at today and which decisions make the most sense for your present circumstance is more of a stay wealthy behavior. And it seems like Dave completely and totally ignored that. Yeah, I, I would hope that this individual measure twice Cut once because that, that was just too quick of an answer from Dave. All right, let's see what else Dave has got for us. Here's a different question that he was asked on a slightly different topic. Don't fall for the trap, Mark. The trap is is that you have to go build a FICO score, and the way you build a FICO score is you go in debt. Why do I do that? So that I can borrow money. Why do I go into? Why do I borrow money so I can build my FICO score? Why do I build my FICO score so I can borrow money? Why do I borrow money so I can build my FICO score? Why do I build my FICO score so I can borrow money? And you, it's a dog chasing its tail, and suddenly you're an American making a hundred thousand dollars a year, and one hundred percent of your money goes out to some stupid butt bank because you worshipped at the altar of the great FICO. Is that a butt bank? And that's what your friends are doing and some of your par their parents are doing, but it's not smart, and it's also not factual. Yeah. Well, yep. that's what my brother said. He said that a credit score is just an I love debt score. It sounds like he's been listening to the Ramsey show. I love uh, debt score. Uh, Brian, do you have a good credit score? Yeah, I mean, that's Would that's you say that you things. love debt? Would you say that's an accurate assessment? I have a good credit score. I love debt. Is that right? I, I, you know, I do. I have a, I think it's around 830 mm -hmm. credit score. Mm -hmm. And um, I 
don't remember going to any altars, kissing any rings, or anything like that. All I did was I was good with my money, and I paid my, you know, if I borrowed money, I paid it back. I've made all my payments on time. I've made sure that I didn't, you know, get out over my skis on mm-hmm. debt. And that's that's probably a great segue into understanding. I don't disagree with, with Dave that the majority of Americans are absolutely horrible with mm-hmm. debt. I mean, debt is chainsaw dangerous is what I like to say is yep. that the fact that, you know, if uh, chainsaws, when you, you gas them up, crank them up, they're scary as all get out because, you know, if you make a, a bad move, you can lose limbs. They're dangerous. But you know what they are very good at? Cutting firewood. Mm-hmm. And um, as a person who had a childhood where we go split logs and cut down trees and and, and f- remove fallen trees, I can tell you, you definitely want to show up with a chainsaw, even if it's extremely dangerous. And that's exactly what debt, I mean, I started at zero. And if I didn't have debt as a tool, I think it would have really hurt me. Because mm-hmm. I, I disagree that Dave said that the quickest way to debt, uh, to, to path is debt-free, because I, I, I get my own personal, I had to have a car to get to work, mm-hmm. and I had zero, so I had to finance $10,000 after I got my first public accounting job. Um, that was important. I don't think a $1,000 car or $2,000 car was going to get me there reliably. I think about mortgages. I think about commercial loans. Mm-hmm. I think about all the ways that I've used debt. It, 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 I think it can be an effective but very dangerous tool. Yeah, I think what's so interesting is Dave set this premise that I go into debt to increase my FICO score. I'm taking on debt so that my credit score mm-hmm. could get better. I think that's a little bit of flawed logic. It doesn't have to cost you anything to have a good credit score. You may utilize debt, and if you utilize it the right way, if you're having a healthy approach to it, having a positive credit score will be the result of behaviors you're already putting into place. I don't know that you have to do a whole lot to improve upon that. And he's making it seem like people are out there getting debt with the sole purpose of doing that. No, if you're someone who uses debt and you use it responsibly and you know how it works, you don't have to go spend a lot of money. You don't have to spend any money to actually be able to have a solid credit score that can help you in other areas and other facets of life. What I think is the key takeaway from this is you have to know thyself. Mm-hmm. And you really, how disciplined are you? Are you a financial mutant or are you one of those crazy people that has credit card debt? Because we, you know, even though we tell people you can use credit cards, we say credit card debt, no way. That's I right. mean, it's, it's no go territory. So you have to have a healthy relationship with debt mm-hmm. to even make this. And, and look, we, we went, we'll go a step further. We actually do an annual survey of our clients where we said, hey, Tell us, because we we work with millionaires all across the country. I want to know how many of you actually use credit cards. Mm-hmm. Not credit card debt, but credit card use. And the results of our survey of our millionaire clients was that 99% of them mm-hmm. use credit cards and pay them off monthly. So I go back to the fact that it's the relationship to debt and how healthy it is that you really should play into that. I don't think FICO is the boogeyman because I have done nothing but just be good with money, pay the debts that I said I was going to pay, and my FICO score is great, which I get benefits on my insurance Mm -hmm. rates. Um, When I do utilities, I don't have to pay deposits. Um, When I go to buy commercial property... I don't have as that much problem in mm-hmm. underwriting. I mean, it's kind of there's there are some dividends to being good with money and um, reaping some rewards. But I like I said, I, ne- I didn't go to any altars, didn't kiss any rings. Um, I, I'm not in debt, and I don't you know I don't pray to to to, to FICO. So all right, we've talked a little bit about debt and some of Dave's view on debt. Let's flip the script a little bit. Let's look at maybe some of the stuff that he says around investing and building wealth. Check this out. This question comes from Thomas in Colorado. He says, I'm struggling to know how much we actually need to retire. I'm 54 and currently have 1.4 million in a 401k, which sounds like a lot to me, but I don't actually know how fast we'll burn through that. So if you're invested in good growth stock mutual funds, I split my personal 401k, Jade does too, uh, among four types, growth, growth and income, aggressive growth and international. And over the last 30 all years, equities? my little Downtown. portfolio of that has averaged over 12, most years over 13%. Wow, Dave. That's and, great. 
But yeah. I mean, it's, it's not really hard to beat the S and P. The S and P oh. is the average of the market. <laughs> oh, so mm-hmm. what do you want to be? I always kind of want to be above average. Hello, the stock market has averaged eleven point eight percent since it began. The Standard and Poor. So it, let's just pretend you're making eleven percent. We'll cut, we'll round down for the people that go bananas when I start talking about this stuff. <laughs> All right, so we're going to round down. You're making eleven percent. All right, if you left three in there. That would so that it would grow a little bit to cover mm-hmm. some inflation mm-hmm. and pulled off eight. Mm-hmm. Uh, that means you'd be living on ninety thousand dollars a year. A Can you do withdrawal that? That's at eight percent. The account is growing by three percent a year if it averages an eleven percent rate of return. Also, good point. So you're right? still getting more so it money. Never burns up. It mm-hmm. runs in perpetuation. So you're not going to run out of money. You're going to be fine. You know, some of the wonky. Certified financial Pharisees oh. types, you know, they go bananas on that calculation. That's us, I guess. The certified financial Pharisees is what he called us? <laughs> Dave, we but, are but friends, it Dave. It sounds great, though. I got to... Dave's a natural branding machine. I mean, because that is... To say that... But, Bo, there is so much here to unpack. First of all, the S&P 500 is not average and you want to beat the average. Mm-hmm. I always tell people I, I, this whole thing of law of accelerating returns and human nature's desire to innovate and grow and always say just don't try to beat the market, be the market yep. because you know this expansion is something you can prosper off of and that's why we love index investing. Mm-hmm. But to say that it's average, I don't think Dave has actually pulled the data on that because what from our own research if you go look at Spiva and look at the data points, 93.1% of all domestic equity funds underperform the index. And he and, and, we're, and when he's talking about, he said, it's just not that hard to beat the S&P 500. And yet, people that are paid hundreds of thousands, maybe million dollars of a year to do this professionally... Can't do it. 93% over a 10-year period underperform their stated index. It sounds to me like beating the market is indeed a difficult thing to do. Well, I I just would encourage people, don't try to beat, because even in the data I've followed, if you go look at the same Spivo research, they'll they'll not only show you, because you can do quick math and Mm -hmm. see 6.9% of advisors, I mean, of managers actually did overperform. So Dave is is saying that he's the one that chose Mm -hmm. that 6.9%. But if you go read read the research, consistency is just not there. Yep. Meaning that if you have a fund that did really good in this 10-year period and you did another rolling period a few years in the future, there's a very large likelihood that the 6.9% mm-hmm. isn't going to the be same the ones. same funds. Because yep. the consistency of beating the indexes is just so hard to do. So I would just say, don't waste the calories. I like index investing. Now, I'd like to move to something else Dave talked about because, man, there was a lot to unpack there. He talked about that you can pretty much count on you're going to make 12% mm-hmm. on your investments. And then he did this weird math where he said 11, he, he rounded down to 11 for us. I've heard 12 for years from him, but he rounded down to 11 for us Pharisees. And then he said, you know, we got inflation at 3%. So you can have a safe withdrawal rate of 8%. And the only way he can do that is that you have to be just wildcat crazy Mm -hmm. with your allocation. And Dave was because he's 100% equity, even for somebody who's at the threshold of retirement. And let's, but would you mind reviewing what was the allocation he said? Yeah, so let's walk through what Dave said. He said that when he comes to designing a portfolio, you should do 25% growth in income, 25% growth, 25% aggressive growth, and 25% international. Woo. All equities, all on the aggressive side. So we said, all right, let's check and see what does this portfolio actually look like? So we went and we picked some funds and we said, okay, let's look at a handful of funds to determine if we could build what we're going to call the Ramsey portfolio, looking at the asset classes as he defines them. And these are the four funds that we're looking at. We said, for growth and income, let's use the Columbia Large Cap Index. For the growth fund, let's use a JP Morgan mid cap growth. For aggressive growth, let's use the Franklin small cap growth. We're using different market capitalizations here, so we get some diversification, trying to give them the benefit of the doubt. And then for international, let's use the American Funds Euro Pacific Growth Fund. So a lot of you are going to say, well, this all comes down to the data. Did you guys cherry pick the worst performing investments you could for Dave to put him uh, at a disadvantage? No, we actually did the exact opposite. We cherry picked 
we 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 ran you know screens, did some research. These between these different categories: growth and income growth, aggressive growth, and international. We try to look at it as we are commission advisors. What's the best things we can go out there and buy um, for our clients? To try to give them the best chance of doing this. This I wouldn't even be surprised if this wasn't something that Dave had in his own portfolio. So I'd be in the comments. Let us know if you've had any experience with these. But we try to give them the best shot of success as possible. And and guess what the data showed, Bo. Show them. That's the thing about the Money Guy Show. We show you the numbers. So look at this. If we look at this portfolio compared to the S&P 500 of the last 20 years, so starting in 2003 all the way to 2023, the S&P 500 would have annualized about 10.5%. This Ramsey portfolio only, I use only because it's still strong, it's, it's only a great return. annualized 9.8%. So it basically almost matched the S&P. It did not, over the last 20 years, grossly outperform the S&P, and we didn't get to that 12 13% number that Dave threw out. So this is looking at the last 20 years. Well, what happens if we even back that down a touch more? Because what if we think about doing this or implementing this strategy over a 10-year period? Well, you can see over the last 10 years, from 2013 to 2023, the S&P 500 over that time has annualized over 14% per year. This Ramsey portfolio of 25% growth in income, 25% growth, 25% aggressive growth, and 25% international only annualized 10.8%. Again, don't mishear us. We're not saying those are bad rates of returns. What we are saying is they weren't better than the S&P 500. Yeah, and that, that's the key takeaway is I think that actually Dave's portfolios did great. I mean, so this this could work. It's pretty risky, mm-hmm. but it did do great. So I mean, even ties to the 11, close to the eleven percent that he that he was talking about. But to say that you can beat the S and P five hundred consistently might be a bridge too far. And then I want to remind people: this is let's let's pull this back because we're not talking about a portfolio for a twenty something. Mm-hmm. This is a caller. There was at retirement. Yep. Or were they even in they were, retirement? They were nearing retirement. Nearing retirement. Because when I look at this, and we're, we're, here we are, certified financial Pharisees, as Dave called us, certified financial planners. Registered. We, we, we actually have to think about risk management, you know, mm-hmm. stress testing, making sure that clients get the best retirement experience, not the, hey, you retire and hey, we messed up some things, mm-hmm. and we told you you could pull out eight percent, but reality is you better be fire up the the pots of water, put some potatoes in there because you're gonna need to cut your expenses down because there is a withdrawal rate of eight percent is unrealistic. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of time, you know, in financial planning, here's a term that I would encourage anybody who thinks they're going to do eight percent. Go out there and research what sequence of return risk Mm -hmm. is, is because unfortunately, I love that the S&P 500 does get close to 11% historically. But the fact that is missed there is that it's not in these nice little prepackaged 11% annual boxes. Mm -hmm. You will have years that you'll make 23, 24%. You'll have years that you lose 12%. You'll have years that you make 8%. It comes all, it is all over the Mm -hmm. place. Hence why we diversify, hence why we plan for the long term. This type of strategy, doing 100% equity, assuming an Eight withdrawal, eight percent safe withdrawal rate is very, very dangerous for retirees. And it's not just anecdotal evidence. There have actually been people that have studied this. You perhaps have heard of the Trinity study where they said, hey, you know, let's look at different periods of time throughout history and see what withdrawal rate would have been sustainable given different allocations to equities, given different allocations to bonds, and what was a consistent withdrawal rate that would have weathered any time period. And this was actually a study that was updated when they did the Trinity study a number of years ago, looking at 30-year retirements. And what they basically said is if we look at rolling 30-year periods, factoring in inflation, What withdrawal rate would give us the highest probability of success without running out of money? And the conclusion they came at that is a withdrawal rate somewhere around 4% is probably historically a sustainable safe withdrawal rate if you have some sort of diversified portfolio. And we say some sort of diversified, that's anywhere from 25% stocks up to 100% stocks. 
you would say that you have a greater than 75% probability of success of not running out of money. Now, when you factor in Dave's 8% withdrawal rate and you run through this same study looking at 30-year time horizons, you can see that even a 100% stock portfolio, the most aggressive portfolio, which is pretty close to the allocation that Dave recommends, is less than a 50% success rate, meaning in less than 50% of scenarios, would you have made it all the way to retirement without having to decrease that withdrawal rate? Well, then... If you diversified your assets at all and went to 75% stocks or 50% stocks, the success rate dropped even further. And we've said a lot, Brian, that as you move to financial independence and as you move through retirement, your allocation should ultimately get more conservative. So it seems to me that Dave's saying that an 8% withdrawal rate is sustainable over the long term just does not line up with the data. Yeah, I know a number of you go listen to this on the podcast. You know, I go have the visuals in front of you. So I want to just make sure I give you the details. And I also encourage you, go out to our YouTube channel um, and check this out. Go to Money Guy, and we have all that stuff po- published and posted there as well. But just for, for those that can't see, for a 4% safe withdrawal rate and a diversification where at least 50%, because that's what the Trinity study likes to, 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 to draw attention to, a 50% equity portfolio and better, meaning greater than 50%, you're probably still looking at, at the 4%, about a 90% mm-hmm. effective retirement you know, success rate. Yep. And that's what, if you were thinking about it, you're doing a stress test and you're running all these different scenarios, if you use this 4% safe withdrawal rate for a 30-year retirement, 90% likelihood of success. Go to the exact same hmm. data point with Dave's, and now you've got a range between 25 and 45% mm-hmm. success rate. I want True talk. If you're at the threshold of retirement and your financial advisor comes to you and says, we think there's a 25 to, to 45% chance you're going to be okay, you feeling all right about you, that? You feeling confident no. about that retirement? No. Now, that's that's the difference. Look, Dave is not completely wrong that obviously we love um, investing in the S&P 500. We love the ever-expanding economy. I think that investing in equities over the long term can be immensely rewarding. But do not underestimate the value of knowing where your boundaries and barriers are, because we want you to have a successful retirement, not one that is a hope and a prayer mm-hmm. and, and, and and just gives you lots of sleepless nights, which I'm kind of shocked because Dave is so good. He he talks about how often behavior, it's, you know, it's, it's 80% behavior, you know, the 20% math or all the other things he talks about. What do you think you're going to do when you do a, a portfolio like this, taking this type of risk, do you think that you're giving you the best likelihood of having success with your behavior, or you think you're going to be at the whim of your emotions and sleepless nights with this type of wildcat type behavior? And if you think about it, even the outcomes, right, an 8% withdrawal rate would allow you to save less for retirement. If you're only going to have a 4% withdrawal rate, you would have to save more for retirement. But what is a worse outcome? Saving too much for retirement and having a better retirement than you anticipated or saving too little and having to make some very severe concessions later on in retirement. I just think that Dave's advice, especially when it comes to retirement planning, is perhaps just not as sound as it would have been had he went and pursued his CFP designation. (laughs) All right, let's check out this next one. Here is another video, different advice from Dave. My wife and I are 27 years old. Uh, we're projecting a pre-tax income this year of 198000 Wow. We have, wow. we have no debt at all right now. We have five months of expenses saved up in a money nice. market account. In our house account, in another money market, we have 52000 saved up, and we're mm-hmm. averaging about 2700 a month of deposits going into that house account. Mm-hmm. My debate is, is should we continue to save up through the next year and, you know, get a conventional 15-year mortgage, or should we live by renting through the next move and try to pay cash? You know, I don't yell at people for getting a mortgage, a 15-year fixed-rate mortgage, uh, and you pay it off as fast as you can. Uh, but, but between us, because you asked, the shortest path to wealth is debt-free. So if I were in your shoes... I would have to save up and pay cash because I don't borrow money. 
I have become convinced that borrowing money short circuits the shortest path to wealth. The shortest path to wealth is no debt, 100% of the time. I'm convinced of that. The shortest path to wealth is 100% is no debt 100 percent that sounds like a guarantee of the time that does sound like a guarantee that sounds that's just some aggressive language because think about what this means if you're saying hey the shortest path to wealth is no debt when you got to buy a car you pay cash no exceptions when you got to go to college you pay cash no exceptions when you got to buy a house you pay cash no exceptions that is the shortest path to wealth, and I just don't know if experientially. Well, look, experientially, let, me, that's let me break it down. I always, I always put this into two pots, two baskets. Get wealthy behaviors, stay wealthy behaviors. Without a doubt, Dave is tremendously successful. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I think a lot of people. I see a lot of people post what what Dave's worth, and they way mm-hmm. under get it because I think Dave is getting. He's right at the doorstep of a billion. He's on that dollars. B one. I think he's close, close to the, the billion B. dollar mark. So he's tremendously successful financially himself. So yeah, without a doubt, stay wealthy behavior when you're that successful uh, is that you want to just pay cash for everything. Don't don't even fool with debt. But the reality is is that when you're at the beginning of your journey, is, once again, you unfortunately have to deal with the tool of debt. Um, whether we're talking about reliable transportation for your family, getting the first house. This person is crushing it, by the way. I mean, they have, they have a great income, right under $200,000. They have no debt. They have five months of cash reserves. They're depositing $2,700 a month, you know, above and beyond what they're already doing. So they're, they're crushing it. Mm-hmm. So I'll, I do. I want to give Dave the credit that he told him, hey, yeah, you don't have to pay cash for your next house. You can use a mortgage. Um, and he's going to recommend a 15 but he then went the step further. I just want everybody to know you don't have to. You got to do the get wealthy behaviors first before you can do the balling move of paying cash for everything. You know, and Dave's owns, if you go follow his story, from I guess in his 20s, oh, was it to, to probably mid 30s when he had that boom bust? Mm-hmm. You know, he used a lot of debt and then he went broke. Because he over leveraged, he was doing, you know, he was he was being a cowboy, mm-hmm. and then he went teetotal, no debt after that. But I think that Dave, the party doesn't, is that the the success came at such a way that he had windfalls of money that started dumping his way, so it was easy for cash because he had a big shovel, he had lots of income coming in. A lot of people are going to your 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 rise to success is going to be much more. You get. It, a good job, you get pay raises, you're going up at 8% a year, 12% a year, 15% as you get pay raises. It's not going to be you go from zero to a million dollars to multi-million dollars a year. That that creates a different journey. Mm-hmm. And I think that's something that we need to just draw attention to when you're giving advice to people. But, but Bo, you want to talk about because we're also, I want to bring this back to today. We're in a unique housing market. Yeah, it's it's pretty difficult. What's gone on in housing, what's, what's gone on with interest rates and the, the rise in housing prices, affording a home is a hard thing right now. I mean, I mean, for most folks, just affording a home is very difficult. Well, when you throw something on it, like doing a 15-year mortgage, it makes a really hard thing even harder even harder, much less trying to pay for it in cash. That's why we've come up with the rules that we've come up with. That's why when we say that you want to buy a house and we have an entire home buying checklist, you can go check out, go to money.guy.com slash resources, and you can check that out to see what that looks like. We want you to buy a house, be there for five to seven years. We want you to make sure that when you put money down in your first house, you don't have to do 20% and we want to make sure that your total housing costs don't exceed 25% of your gross income. And if you can do that, those rules will give you some flexibility. And here's the case study to show you that. Let's assume you have a young couple with a median household income in this country of just under $75,000. And they want to buy a house. They're going to put 3% down because they understand the money guy rules. And they're going to keep their payments, when you look at the principal and the interest, below 25% of their gross income. So now they have to make a decision. Do I buy a 
15 year mortgage or do I buy a 30 year mortgage? Well, when you look at it in today's terms, when you factor in the fact that a 30 year mortgage rate is at 7.44% and a 15 year mortgage rate is at 6.75%, if they were going to have that cash outflow and buy a, a house with a 15 year mortgage, they could afford a home that costs $181,000. However, if they give themselves flexibility and instead opt for the 30-year mortgage, now they can like they can buy a home with the same expected cash outflow on a monthly basis of two hundred and thirty thousand dollars. Well, right now, in this economic environment, a one hundred and eighty-one thousand dollar home versus a two hundred thirty thousand dollar home might be the difference in actually finding a house versus not finding a house at all. Yeah, with with what happened with inflation and the crazy interest rates right now, the ability to boost your purchasing power but still stay within the realm of having boundaries of 25%, the 30% is going to give you mm-hmm. that margin, that flexibility. And look, I want to I want to pay a little respect. Dave talks about that in his millionaire study, the the largest in history, millionaires pay their mortgages off in 10 years. You can do that with a 30-year mortgage. I'm proof of that myself. Mm -hmm. Um, And the fact that I think, and and by the way, that research, the the data point that's always missing when Dave shares that is because I I did my own internal research on, on, on what they did and asked some questions of some Ramsey individuals I know, and they confirmed this does not first homes. So these are people probably my age in their their 40s and 50s who are in that already at that millionaire track that are paying it off because they just are at the stay wealthy behavior and paying down debt is a stay wealthy behavior. But while you're on the journey to get wealthy, I want you to just keep things and understand. We understand you're going to get into the messy middle. You're going to have mm-hmm. obligations of your time, of your money. What can we do to give you the maximum purchasing power, especially in these unique times where buying a house is not the easiest thing, but also leave enough margin in your life through your monthly payments that you can also save and invest and build mm-hmm. your best financial future, that stuff's important. And another thing I would think through, because you know, Dave is saying, you know, all cash, pay it off, pay it off, pay it off. Well, let's assume that this caller, maybe this was a couple of years ago, and interest rates were a little bit lower than where they are now. Maybe they're in a two and a half, three and a half, four percent mortgage. It would be really difficult, especially for a young person to say, hey, you know what? Uh, you got into the house, you took out that mortgage, but now you ought to aggressively pay down that mortgage. I would be concerned that they are trying to sur- solve a shorter term problem without paying attention to the longer term problem. And Dave always uses this language. He says, well, yeah, the reason that you say that is you're not accounting for risk. 100% of homes that have been foreclosed on had a mortgage on them. Okay. of people that ran out of money for retirement did not have enough money for retirement, right? I can use the same exact logic. You need to look at your own personal situation, say, man, does this make the most sense for what my ultimate goals are long-term? And when you talk about risk, I I, I don't mind sharing because Dave made an absolute statement, which always, uh, maybe it's because we're certified and licensed. So we're taught very quickly, don't make any absolutes in anything financial because you can get yourself in a lot of trouble. But he said uh, 100% being debt free is better than the other. I've actually he's never he said he never had anybody tell him they've had regrets about paying off their house. Mm. I actually had I, you know I taught a Sunday school class and I had a widow who came up to me and goes, "I know what you do for a living. I would love for you to make sure you get the message out that when my husband passed away, I came into a, a life insurance policy and I prepaid my mortgage because that's what everybody told me to do was get out of debt." She goes, but I didn't do the other parts that I should have done. I didn't figure out what my budget was. I didn't figure out, you know, because I think she thought, because she had three to six months and that was going to be enough, but she had not done a good enough job of knowing what her margin to live off of. So she used this windfall of money Mm -hmm. all at once. And that's the part, I get it. When you guys talk about the baby steps, when I bring up that it is riskier to have a mortgage that's 98% paid down but then lose your job than it is to have a mortgage that's paid down 60%, but you still got a nice emergency reserves, you've got a nice investment portfolio that you could actually get access to within two to three days mm-hmm. you know, by placing a trade and getting the money. Because that is what I think a lot of people don't take. They're so just 
on a journey to get out of debt as fast as possible. And that breaks my heart when I see 20 and 30 year olds doing that because that's a stay wealthy behavior. The risk is you won't become wealthy Mm -hmm. because you didn't get that money a chance to work for you and build wealth. And if you're somebody who comes into a windfall, don't get in a hurry to make big knee jerk steps. You need to probably move slowly, figure out what your living expenses are, figure out what you need. And maybe the prudent decision would have been pay down half the mm-hmm. mortgage, shore up your financial foundation. But that 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 always rings true. You know, I, I think about that when um, people tell me they want to pay down their mortgage. I'm like, that's great once it's debt free. But if you have only paid down 98% of the mortgage and you lose your job and you lose your cash flow, you're going to find that without an income, the, the, the banks aren't going to be too too quick to give you the money that you have locked inside your home equity. It, it's a true risk. Brian, we love, we love Ramsey Solutions. We love all the folks over there. We love the information they put out there, but we don't always agree with it completely. And so I think this was a lot of fun to be able to walk through some of the stuff that we agree with, but also be able to talk about some of the stuff that we don't agree with because at the end of the day, Personal finance is personal, and it makes me nervous when someone says, this is 100% the only way that you can go about making financial decisions. It just makes me a little nervous, and I like that we can be a voice on the other end of that spectrum. Yeah, I like, because I think Dave does a great job of getting everybody out of debt. Mm-hmm. And you should look, you should be scared of debt. If you're not scared of debt, you're using it wrong. If every time you go and sign on, um, for debt, and you don't lose some sleep about it, or the ar- the hair on your arms doesn't stand up, you are definitely not respecting the the danger of it. But I'm telling you, there are a group of you that are probably more financial mutants. Uh-huh. You're looking to maximize every dollar that comes your way because you're on a journey. You're on a journey to build something pretty spectacular. You don't have those common sense problems with debt. You're trying to figure out what's the best way to maximize every dollar that comes into my army of dollar bills. And that's what we're going to be. We're going to respect the food, the financial order of operations, and make you the best version of yourself. Go check out moneyguy.com. I'm your host, Brian Preston, Bo Hansen, Money Guy team, Financial Mutants Unite, out!